Hi, and welcome back. I'm Jason Grindstaff, and today we're continuing our discussion of the psychology of human performance. And we're going to really be focusing today's lecture on stress. If you've ever been in a really stressful situation, for example, uh, you're a diver and you are uh, standing on the top of this platform and getting ready to dive for the gold medal. No, not all of us will uh, have that experience. Uh, we've all been in pressure filled situations. So whether you're diving for that Olympic gold medal or uh, you're standing in front of that free throw line uh, with point five seconds left and your team is down by one or you're walking into a group fitness class for the first time uh, in years and you feel like everybody's looking at you. We all know what it's like to be in these stressful situations. And so when that, that, uh, that sweat begins to bead on our forehead or uh, if you've ever noticed as silly as it sounds, uh, you know, in a stressful situation, uh, we feel like we got to go to the bathroom. Uh, or in a stressful situation where you feel like uh, you've got this tunnel vision. Um, these are all common experiences when we experience stress, and we're gonna take a look at in today's lecture uh, why that happens and how the human body reacts in these moments and what we can do to uh, better cope with these demands and uh, improve performance. So let's go ahead and uh, jump right in. Uh, but before we do, I'm uh, going to give you a couple of trivia questions. So the first one, uh, kind of as a mental warm-up. So the first one is, uh, which former NFL quarterback is the great-great-grandson of Brigham Young? Even if you don't know football that well, uh, you, you might have been able to guess this, uh, Steve Young. Not all that difficult of a question. But what if I told you in the next question, uh, I was going to give you $100 if you can answer this question in less than 10 seconds. The original phrase, uh, Sean Mott, means the king is dead. What is the English translation for this phrase and what popular board game does it describe? So let's say you had three seconds left. Three, two, one. And if you got it, you'd get that $100. Well, if you guessed correctly, uh, the answer is the game of chess. And Sean Mott in per uh, Persian stands for checkmate. Regardless of if you got that or not, even in that hypothetical situation, you might have noticed some sort of a physical or physiological reaction uh, when I gave you that hypothetical situation. When I gave you that demand of the potential of earning $100 if you guessed it correctly in under 10 seconds, you might have noticed this physical uh, response in your body, maybe increased heart rate. You thought, wow, I could win, I could win some money if I get this. Uh, increased heart rate, respiration, kind of that, uh, that physical response that sweat response, that you know, sweating on the forehead in an extreme example of stress. So we're going to look today at how stress, arousal, anxiety, how these concepts affect human performance. And what we can do as uh, professionals to help the clients, patients, athletes that we work with in these situations. Uh, if you're taking this, uh, if you're watching this video as part of a class, we have five key objectives. Yet in this video, we're just going to focus in on these first three objectives. So we want to explain how anxiety arousal affect performance. We want to compare and contrast the key concepts related to arousal, stress, and anxiety. And then we we'll want to summarize the various methods for measuring arousal anxiety. Our last two objectives we'll look at in uh, some other videos. But how does arousal and anxiety affect performance? Well, it does in a number of ways. So, I mean, first of all, when a when a person experiences uh, a, a stressful state, uh, what we notice, the research tends to suggest that uh, it increases muscle tension. Um, we get we get fatigued. We get tired a whole lot quicker. Uh, we also don't coordinate movements throughout our body uh, as easily. For example, you might be standing uh, you know, above that uh, that eight foot putt in a really nerve wracking situation, and you feel the uh, feel the jitters of the of your hands and body. So we're just not able to coordinate movements as effectively. So those are some of the physical ways that stress um, and anxiety influence the body. But then there's also some, some cognitive uh, changes. And what we notice is that there are changes in attention, concentration, and our uh, ability to visually search uh, our, our field of vision. So for example, we notice a, a, a perceptual narrowing. Um, in this case, we're not able to pay attention to as many critical cues in our environment. Uh, but as well, there's also a, a very physical uh, change in our peripheral vision. So that peripheral vision, uh, what we lock in on right ahead of us is our 
focal vision, but everything out here is our peripheral vision. Well, in our anxiety provoking situations, we notice a narrowing of that peripheral vision where people get locked in on this tunnel vision, if you will. And so if you've ever seen the movie, The Blind Side, in a really stressful situation, literally we don't see what's out here in our, uh, in our visual field as we get locked in. Uh, we also notice that there's a shift to a dominant style. So sometimes for some people, some athletes, some performers during anxiety provoking situations, we see that they, uh, they maybe revert back to maybe an internal focus of attention where maybe uh, they focus on heart rate, respiration, these physiological signs. Or for some people in anxiety provoking situations, they lock in on an external cue. So typically people have a dominant style of attention and they will shift to that dominant style in these um, stressful situations. Also, uh, this third point, it, uh, people tend to uh, begin paying attention to inappropriate cues, uh, what we might also call task irrelevant cues. Uh, so let's go back to our example of being on the free throw line with uh, 0.5 seconds left and your team is down by one. So instead of that, uh, that basketball player focusing on the body mechanics, their breathing, uh, their pre-shot routine and shoot and, and score, maybe they're paying attention to, oh wow, uh, there's only 0.5 seconds left, our team is down by one, I got to make this shot. And it's just this cascade of thinking that starts to take over. And in that case, we would say those cues of the time, the score, those things should all be irrelevant to the athlete at that moment in time. An applied example of this, uh, and there are tragic stories of this from year to year, uh, down in Florida, the, uh, a popular thing to do is go cave diving. So the scuba divers will go down underwater and explore these underground caves. And every year there are uh, unfortunate casualties from people dying in these situations. Well. Uh, if I just read out the in part, part of what happens in that in those situations is people become disoriented uh, in the in these really dark, deep caves. And when people become disoriented, uh, that elicits this stress response. And when that stress response, we know that uh, heart rate, breathing increases, and some people will, t will become disoriented. Uh, they begin to pay attention to inappropriate cues. They get lost. They get distracted. And then also, they're utilizing oxygen oxygen at a quicker rate and so they utilize that uh, those oxygen tanks much more quickly and unfortunately uh, many people have died in those situations. Um, two important terms that come up that we need to uh, that we need to understand and wrap our head around when it comes to anxiety is this difference between arousal which is that uh, that physiological and the psychological or the emotional activation of the body and how that might differ from anxiety itself. So uh, when we talk about in, you know, being in an energized or an aroused state, it doesn't necessarily mean anxiety. Um, you know, a person can have a high heart rate, you know, be breathing heavy um, in anticipation for, for an athletic event, event, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're uh, highly anxious. It could uh, mean that they're interpreting that event as, uh, hey, I'm pumped, I'm ready, let's do this. Uh, whereas anxiety is really that a negative emotional state. It's that uh, perception of you know, nervousness or worry, it's that apprehension uh, that, that comes with that physiological, uh, that psychological activation. So in of itself, arousal is neither a negative or a positive thing, it's neutral. But when it comes to anxiety, that is the negative interpretation or the negative emotional state associated with anxiety and so as well. We had just mentioned that uh, arousal can be uh, can be measured along a continuum from a, a deep sleep all the way to extremely excited and anywhere along there uh, it's important that we take a look at and I really determine for particular areas of performance we all need to be in an ideal place along this continuum for example if you're standing over that eight foot putt that we were talking about earlier you probably need a lower level of physiological arousal versus being a football lineman um, getting ready to uh, defend uh, that player who is coming at your quarterback or, or running back. Uh, different arousal needs there. 
uh, we can take a look at this relationship between trait and state anxiety. These are two more terms that come up in our chapter that I think are important to distinguish. Uh, you know, when we talk about anxiety, we can be a highly anxious person or we can be anxious in a moment. And those are two different concepts. If we talk about state anxiety, that's the kind of anxiety that somebody experiences right now and in the moment. Standing over again, that eight foot putt, a person could be uh, anxious, have state anxiety in that moment. Whereas trade anxiety, uh, that's the type of anxiety that is a personality disposition. It's more of an enduring uh, trait that the person has. And what we know from the sports psych research is that um, highly, uh, a person who has high trait anxiety typically is going to show a propensity to have more state anxiety, especially when they're being evaluated or in situations where they perceive that they're being evaluated by others. Next, we're going to take a look at uh, you know, how we might measure anxiety or arousal. Uh, there are certainly uh, physiological signs that we can measure. So we could uh, indirectly measure somebody's uh, anxiety by their heart rate, their respiration, that uh, galvanic skin response, or other biomarkers. Um, but we can also use uh, more global measures, uh, self-report measures, if you will. So for example, uh, our textbook, if you're following along with, with the Weinberg and Gould textbook, textbook, uh, the competitive state anxiety inventory. And, and you can learn more about these inventories on pages 78, I'm uh, sorry, 79 through 80. So we have one that's the competitive state anxiety inventory. And then as well, there's the uh, sport anxiety scale. And both of these scales would be self-report measures. So what that means is the athlete, him or herself, or the performer would need to fill this out and then they would be able to give uh, that, uh, that person as uh, some kind of a score at the end, a composite score that would help them indicate uh, what their state anxiety is. But there would also be other measures uh, that would give a, a person a good indication of their trait anxiety levels. So those two... Every athlete, every performer knows what it's like to feel those nerves. Uh, physically, I mean, our body is to, has that upset stomach. We start to get that cotton mouth. And our thoughts start to race with some of the negative thinking, that muscle tension. Maybe even the night before, having some difficulty sleeping. Um, you know, waking up multiple times throughout the night or waking up in the morning feeling like, man, I barely slept at all. And just waking up tired and groggy. Uh, these can all be signs or symptoms of anxiety. But let's look at each of these terms, you know, themselves. A sign is something that can be directly observed. So I mean, somebody from the outside looking in, a third party, um, would not be able to look at me and say that I have an upset stomach unless I'm holding my stomach and I'm vomiting. Nobody's going to know if my stomach is upset or if I have racing thoughts. Uh, but a sign would be if I'm pacing back and forth. Um, if I'm sharing a room with, with another athlete uh, and that athlete notices I'm tossing and turning all night uh, and keeping him or her awake, uh, you know, that would be a sign. It's observable. Uh, whereas a symptom has to be reported. So again, uh, you know, if my stomach is upset, if I'm telling my coach that, hey, my stomach feels queasy, um, you know, I can't get my thoughts to slow down, those would be symptoms of anxiety. So far up to this point, we've been talking about and we've repeatedly used this term stress, but we haven't defined that term. Uh, so classically, uh, sports psych research and other psychology studies have defined stress as a substantial imbalance between two things. First of all, that physical and psychological demand, okay? And then it's also that I'm a person's ability to respond or cope with that, uh, with that demand. So we kind of think of this as a scale. It's the, both the demand placed on a person and their ability to, uh, their capability to cope. Uh, and any time that we have any kind of a, uh, a stressful situation, we encounter a stressor, there's always going to be a particular stress response. It doesn't matter if we perceive that stress as to be good or negative, um, there's always a four step process there. So let's look at this process here. Uh, those four steps being there is an environmental demand, there's a perception of the demand, 
stress response, and then behavioral consequences. So let's look at an example here. Let's say that uh, a patient is told by his medical provider he needs to lose some weight. So this man, he joins a gym and decides to attend some kind of a boot camp style class on Monday and Friday mornings. You know, he walks in and notices a few people looking at him and he thinks to himself, they all think I'm old and out of shape. I don't belong here. And as a result, his heart starts to beat faster and faster, um, and he can even feel the sweat starting to bead on his forehead. You know, and, and you know, moments later, he turns around and leaves the group fitness room. So in this case, let's walk through that stress response. Well, what was the environmental demand? See if you can identify it. In this case, it was the man walking into the group fitness room and people looking. Now, people looking at somebody in of itself isn't stressful. It's this man's perception of the demand. And so what did he say to himself? You know, he said multiple things. He, he, you know, he thought, they're all looking at me. They're being critical. And maybe even he thinks, you know, beyond that, you know, I don't belong here. Once we have that, that perception of the demand, there's some kind of a stress response. In this case, we're talking about that physiological activation. Uh, you might have heard of the fight or flight response. So in this case, that, uh, that flight response was, was kicking in for this man, that sympathetic nervous system response of the beating, uh, you know, the sweat beating on his forehead. He's starting to, you know, his heart starting to race. He's breathing faster. He's just getting really nervous. So in that case, he could either stay and fight and face the situation or he fees, flees and he fly, the flight component to that fight or flight response. So that stress response kicks in and then there's this behavioral consequence. In that case, with, uh, with the nerves, with the anxiety, the man abruptly leaves. So if you were a fitness coach, how would you help this gentleman, you know, better cope with the situation? You know, maybe you're that group fitness instructor or you're his personal trainer who's assigned him to go to these group fitness classes or, uh, or you're, you're a friend who is just kind of helping him uh, through this kind of change process. Well, maybe you could help him reframe why people are looking. Maybe it's just possible that they're simply curious about the, this new guy coming into the class and they would be very welcoming. You know, helping him reframe that, that, that cognitive uh, response that he's having there. Uh, you could also help him with teaching him a behavioral reaction. So teach him how to better uh, cope by breathing in that situation and by managing his breathing response and starting to slow that down to more rhythmic, low and slow breathing. Maybe that helps with the negative thinking and then he can face the, uh, you know, face the challenge of this uh, group fitness class. And then finally, let's take a look at, as we wrap up with our first uh, three objectives for, for this presentation, uh, let's look at where or what are some of those sources of stress and anxiety? You know, first of all, I mean, there can certainly be situational sources. So we think of these as our environmental demands. Uh, you know, they, they're external to the person, in other words. Research tends to support that, uh, that as the importance of the event increases or the uncertainty of the event outcome, this will lead to more stressful uh, responses, more anxiety that individuals perceive. We also have personal sources of, uh, of stress and anxiety. And, and so in the sports psych uh, literature, we know that people that have high trait anxiety are more prone to, in specific situations, to experience straight, excuse me, state anxiety. We also know that people with a lower self-esteem um, experience situations to be more stressful and anxiety provoking. A good example of this is social physique anxiety. So somebody with social physique anxiety perceives others as being critical of their, uh, of, of their body composition and, and their physique. Uh, and this could be a person that is uh, it doesn't really, they don't have to be out of shape. You could have somebody that is extremely fit, uh, you know, use a, a gym rat, for example. Um, you know, somebody that is in incredible shape, yet they still perceive other people to be looking at them um, and being highly critical of how their body looks. And so they work extremely hard in those situations, in, in the gym and other situations to compensate for how they perceive others to be perceiving them. So that's going to wrap us up for the first three objectives of, of this chapter.
in your future professions, whether you're going to be a physical therapist, an athletic trainer, a strength and conditioning coach, sports psychology consultant, you're going to be working with people who are going to have to manage stress and anxiety on a daily basis. And so hopefully uh, this gives you a better idea of how stress, anxiety, and arousal affect the human body. Uh, and in future videos, what we'll do is we'll start taking a look at how to cope with stress, anxiety, and arousal to better manage performance and, and make performance a little bit more consistent over time.